Hi, welcome to this session where we'll talk about getting to know another culture. Some ways to study culture, we can look at study whole cultures by an emic study, which is an insider's view, or an etic study, which is an outsider's view. Depending on the amount of assimilation you've been able to do, or who is doing the interaction for you and helping you learn about a culture, it depends on their viewpoint of being an emic or an etic viewpoint of a study for learning about different cultures. And then uh, another way to study culture would be by studying individuals and working with individuals on an individual level and working in those environments. Now realize that that can be skewed because you're getting one person's viewpoint on a whole culture. So you really want to make sure that you do some triangulation, validating, getting from different perspectives. I know when I did uh, culture study in the tribal group that we worked with in Papua New Guinea, I would do like a direct chart and I would ask the same question to like 10 different people. And if the answers seem to be generally the same throughout those 10 questions, then I felt it was pretty safe. But if there was quite a bit of variation, then I might ask five or 10 more people to get a, a sense of what the shape or what the viewpoint of the people in general was on a cultural issue. And that would be more of a focus study and more something that you want to make sure that you triangulate and validate that. Where can information about cultures be found? Obviously, members of that culture, best one. And if you can do a, an immersion trip would be great. So you get a holistic, a good view, a global view, rather than one person's perspective. Obviously, someone who has spent considerable time in the culture, but is not a native member of the culture, so they can kind of break down the differences between your culture and the culture that you're wanting to learn about. Reading about fictional stories from people from that culture or watching film from that culture as well can be helpful. And then how do the people from that culture define themselves? What about publication? they've created less direct forms like commercials and advertisement. Here in Dallas, we have Telemundo and several Spanish geared stations to the Spanish language. So there's another way that you can see different cultural values and aspects and things that are pertaining to a particular culture in Mexico and in Central and South America. We're going to focus on the thinking and knowing area of culture and the worldview and how things are assimilated and processed in different cultures, worldviews, and how thinking is determined. So we'll look at thinking and knowing. We'll look at how do people know things? What does it mean to learn? And can everything be known eventually? And how do people reason? How do people know things? The answer to this question is different from culture to culture. In English speaking cultures, most people acquire knowledge by experience, tacit knowledge that they learn, hands on, working with their hands, being able to listen to an engine and know exactly what's wrong with it, or a tractor, a farmer can, can understand and realize because he has that experience, that hands on ability through books in the English language and Western cultures and through training programs is a lot of the ways that we acquire knowledge. In some cultures, though, that have no written language, experience constitutes what is known and tradition that is passed down orally. This is also referred to as pragmatism. Uh, when we lived in Papua New Guinea with our group of people that we lived among the cafe, a lot of times we would say they created their own reality because they would base a decision for what th happened to them. Like, for example, if they got sick and they ate in somebody else's village, they thought, oh, somebody did sorcery on me to make me sick. And there's a number of different factors that could be involved. As we know in the, in the West, science and germs and biology and things like that, things that can happen. For a lot of folks in these cultures with no written language, they're going by what has happened and their experience. And so forming conclusions based off of experience. What does it mean to learn? Every culture has different answers. In Canada and the United States, learning involves asking questions, which we got from the Greeks, right? From Socrates, the Socratic method. In many other cultures, learning involves opening and examining something, kind of getting your hands around it, feeling it, touching it, opening the concept, spending time with it, and meditating. Asian cultures learn, learning comes from what the teacher facilitates. So the teacher's the expert, teacher's the master, the knowledge expert, and so kind of the center of learning.
Can everything be known eventually? In some cultures, people think with enough science and enough time, the physical world will be completely known. People are not involved in science, have different views. They believe that scientific inquiry will never reveal everything. The difference is in the dichotomy between the East and the West on that, where in the West we want to delineate everything, define everything. In the East, there's more acceptance of mystery and mysticism, and allowing things to be as they are and not to define and create a, a, a black and white uh, an either or, but more of a both and in the Eastern mindset. This is also something that needs to be considered in our intercultural education of the different types of cultures that we're working in and the frustrations that some might have if they're coming from a high view of science working in a different culture doesn't view science that highly and vice versa. Here we look at how do people reason on this chart from the East. We see that the East there uses a pattern of logic and the West uses cause and effect logic. So something caused something to happen. Reason is different from culture to culture. So as patterns of logic for the Asian culture, for example, in the East would be contrasting elements like we hear of yin and yang. Also other examples would be summer pairs with winter and spring pairs with the fall. Other things with that with the East would be linkage to the wholeness of life. In the West, we try to attempt, as we said on the last slide, define and answer black and white. And we try to answer the why question. Why do things happen? Why did this happen? There had to be a reason. For every action, there's a reaction. What caused the effect that we are facing? It could be a tragedy. It could be just something that happens like everyday type things. Why certain things happen to some people and not to others? Well, they made their own luck. Opportunity met preparation and they got a break. Where Whereas in the East, it would see as more circular and holistic that things eventually come together. And in the West, it's more of a linear process. Arab logic, I thought this was interesting, is similar to Western reasoning, like two opposites cannot be true. And you think about where algebra came from, and algebra that we study and learn came through Arab mathematicians and things like that. So we use Arabic numerals. Who wants to use Western numerals, right? We, we see that every year at the Super Bowl, and it's like, okay, now they're getting up there, 50-year-old uh, Super Bowl bowls in 49 and 48 and was like, what is that number the x and the v and the and the i and all these things and now there's an l and you know, how, how to understand and interpret what those symbols mean versus the the number symbols that we use with the arabic numeral system